Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Haseeb Akhtar from Ericsson. Hi, I'm Doug Ng from AT&T. Um, thanks for coming over. Um, we're going to talk about the network API exposure and contents, context management at the edge. And I'd like to mention uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Satai Bokoch from AT&T, was actually supposed to be here as well. But uh, because of some other business priorities, he could not. And uh, we do like to acknowledge his contribution to this uh, work that we're going to present with you. So this is kind of the agenda. So we're going to talk about the 5G architecture and edge, and then go into what are the contexts that are available uh, or could be available, and then how um, those contexts could be exposed uh, in the network, and then we'll talk a little bit about APIs. So going forward, the 5G architecture and how does that impact edge? So basically, you know, the advent of 5G and the evolution of 5G uh, has a lot to, you know, a lot contributions actually towards the realization of edge computing. And a lot of the use cases are actually um, related to 5G, at least initially. So the key thing that happens in, in 5G from, from its earlier version in, in 4G is that there is disaggregation of the RAN and the core network components. And what they have done is they have taken the baseband unit and then disaggregated into two different components called central unit and the distributed unit. So in, in the 3GPP terms, it's called CU and, and DU. And then they have further disaggregated the CU into the CU control plane and then the CU user plane. So basically what you have uh, then that the disaggregation of the baseband now enables you to have this uh, CU CP and the CU EP uh, as virtualized uh, components. So that enables you to put it into a, a cloud, in, you know, not only just at the edge, you can put them in, in any cloud, including you know, private, public, and, and whatnot. And then also on the core network side, uh, there is a thing called uh, control and user plane separation, or COPS. So that's also another dis disaggregation where they have uh, disaggregated the control plane and the user plane separately. And then uh, the user plane is, is shown here, UPF, user plane function, that also now can be virtualized. I mean, not only virtualized, it's now more componentized and can be moved uh, about you know, from the centralized data center to other places. And also, you know, there are a lot of other functions that have emerged as part of the, the disaggregation of the core. Uh, there is a, a terminology called service-based architecture, which is not uh, today's topic, but I just kind of highlighted that here in this uh, blue background on our own app. Uh, that shows that, you know, basically the EPG today, which is the, the SGW and PGW and, and MME, so those have been kind of, those three components have been decomposed into, into various things. And we'll go over a couple of them which are relevant to the, to the edge, um, at least the API part of it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention here, that all of these are going to be managed on a service uh, layer by, uh, by ONAP. So we also envision that there is going to be a version of ONAP that will sit into Edge, and we're just calling it ONAP with a small e uh, on, the, on the left part. So I guess the takeaway from here, if you see in that red circle, that that's where we can kind of take both the RAN and the, and the core network components, meaning the CU, the CU CP and the, and the CU UP from the RAN part and the, the UPF and the user plane function. And, and put them into one place, and then you have access to IP services of either the operator's IP service or the internet, or even any other third-party IP services. So this basically gives you a tremendous capability to move things around and bring components to the, uh, to the edge. And the other th thing that I wanted to mention, that the examples that we're showing here 
is the data center site and the central office sites, uh, cell and uh, antenna sites. So those are, you know, it, it shows here that we're putting edge in the, in the central office site, but it can be anywhere. It could be, you know, the cell sites or as well as in the antennas. Uh, any combination of those components can go on there. Anything else, Doug? No, I think it's, um, I think the one thing is just to reiterate is the central office um, and the data centers are really just examples um, of locations. A lot of what I think in the future what we'll be seeing is the edge will be defined not by location but by workload or capabilities. Okay. So moving forward, so this is kind of the, the example of the use case. On the left side, and these are 5G use cases actually. So on the left side, you have kind of the three um, you know, components of 5G, and this is defined by IMT 2020. So the latency, the target is about one milliseconds. Um, and that's basically from the UE to the edge of the network. And then the throughput uh, about at the edge, on the average throughput is about 100 megabits per second. And the peak throughput is in the 20 gigabits per second. So, so remember that these are the target for 5G. Uh, in the initial uh, rollout, it will be uh, you know, much less than that. But we're, you know, as, as the technology matures, we're going to move towards that. And on, the, on this you know, multi-shaped uh, diagram here, we have different uh, components of, I guess, the characteristics or the KPI. So the throughput is like, uh, you know, it's, it's denoted by the T here, throughput. Then we're going towards clockwise latency, uh, reliability, mobility, availability, uh, energy efficiency, and the user and device density. So, and then on the, on the bottom here, we have different use cases. We have the mobile broadband, then massive MTC. Um, so that's different I, IoT devices, basically. And then the dense information society, where you have a lot of download of information um, at, at a location, and then the connected vehicles. <clears throat> and then you have those different type of third party applications, the air, VR, uh, different manufacturing <clears throat> and the tactile type of components. So if you go um, with the use cases, so this, this one shows that basically we need to have a uh, you know, high level of availability uh, and mobility for the mobile broadband and the other dimensions are not as much. And you know, going for the next one in the, in the massive MTC, we need like you know, the higher user density um, and uh, we have a lot of energy efficiency and also a lot of availability and the other dimensions are not as much. So I'm not going to go through this altogether, but then the next use case is the dense information society. Um, the next one is the connected vehicles, you know, where you need uh, availability, mobility, as well as reliability and, and the latency. And then uh, comes the, the AR VR type of scenario where the throughput and latency are the, are the key aspects. Um, so the next one, Doug. All right, so we talked a little, or quite a bit about the network and especially the 5G oriented side. Um, I want to look at some of the areas of focus that we have picked out. And this is not a comprehensive list. There's a lot of different areas where we feel that there are um, further work that needs to be done to further our understanding, further the build capabilities of the network or further our understanding of the products and services. So. Uh, number one, I'm just going to go through the list real quick. Number one is the, you know, what is the IT environment and, and what are the network operators going to provide? It's one of the key aspects is, is um, there's a combination of the applications and the offer that the, that the service provider will provide. That's sort of what we would, what would likely see, hopefully see at the edge. So how do we get those two to, to um, understand each other, work together, and uh, determine what at least from the application and uh, environment perspective, what it's going to look like. Uh, from the, net, the traffic and networking perspective, uh, as Asib mentioned, there's an ability in 5G to, to what we call breakout traffic or branch out traffic uh, in several different places along the network. Um, but there still needs to be an understanding of how we're going to do that. At the end of the day, we're still on IPv6 or IPv4 network and we still need to look at how we're going to uh, manage the, the routing of traffic out these various uh, exit points, um, how we're going to disco discover the, the content or the information 
where it resides, where it's best going to be served out, and, um, and how are the devices or the users going to discover those locations. Uh, and then the next step is to really make this all sort of work together. We need to look at um, uh, what we're calling here network APIs. Uh, network APIs are, are both sort of what the network attributes will be. We'll cover a little bit of those later. Um, but also potentially what the subscriber, uh, who the subscriber is or, or what kind of um, service have they, have they signed up for. And not only what the uh, APIs are, but how are we going to expose them. Uh, in the desire to have a one set of APIs for both the internal needs and the external needs, uh, that sort of, if we do that, that would imply that we provided some level of simplicity, uh, but we have to now understand how, what's the best method of serving out uh, externally the uh, information that is desired or required, um, but still protecting the network, still protecting privacy of the customer, uh, et cetera. Uh, other parts of the edge, and some of the others, others of focus, and you've heard a lot about that this, during these uh, sessions here, is that we need to find the right footprint, if you will, the right size for the VIM. And some of these locations will be very small as far as compute and storage, uh, physical environment constraints. You know, how, how, how do we find the right optimal VIM for, for this type of environment? And last one on the list here is the actual infrastructure. Who is going to own it? Who's going to operate it? Uh, who, you know, how are we going to choose the environment that we're going to run on? Um, so, so we talked a, a little bit um, earlier about context, I think, but we'll delve a little bit deeper. Context to me is like who, what, and where, uh, those types of questions that you want answered or you have uh, questions about uh, in more detail and you want to get answers to. So, you know, for example, um, you know, monetization, how would I monetize the experience that you're, you're having or what, mon what monetization options would, would the, the would the service provider have? What information can I get as if I'm an application supplier about the user who's, who's, a, uh, who's asking to use the, the application? For example, uh, are they a prepaid user or a postpaid user? Are they signed up for premium QoS, um, et cetera? What's, what's their, what type of in, in, um, subscription do they have and, and how, um, are they, how close are they to their, their thresholds if they're on a, a rate plan has a limited amount of usage. Uh, user information, this is our user location information. This is all a set of information related to, you know, where are you now and how best to kind of match where you are with, with the right experience, the right applications, et cetera. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, assume that we need to provide information like latency and bandwidth available at this location. Uh, whether or not you are moving, if you're moving, how fast are you moving, and what direction are you moving. Uh, how, what are the conditions of the network? Are they um, free and open for high bandwidth? Are they congested and have a relatively constrained amount of resources? And we have to be careful about um, how we allocate resources so we treat everybody fairly and all the applications can still uh, utilize the, the experience that they need. Um, and some of the other things that people are maybe interested in are things like uh, uh, topology of the network. You may want to know, again, where the network functions are, so you can match network functions with the applications, things of that nature. So, so context is, is very broad, but it truly is, I think the upper left says it quite well, is that it's going to be king. It's really, from the edge perspective, that's one of the key uh, capabilities that we need to uh, leverage, exploit, um, and provide uh, in a manner that's safe, um, but is, is easily to consume. Yeah, so basically then, then the APIs, you know, how do we b make use of them? So as I've shown earlier, and Doug mentioned a few other things, that the 5G allows, you know, re-examining of the architecture. So we can now move things um, into the edge, and then a lot of the context that becomes available. Um, the big drivers, uh, we still feel that the service agility and and the reduction of the cost. So 
so one of the thing of the API is to you know have quick service deployment. So the service velocity would be much more faster. Um, and then the flexibility of the components that you can put into, into Edge from an architecture and deployment perspective. And, and we believe that this will lend to innovations and, and bringing new applications which will leverage the, the 5G strengths and the capabilities in the bandwidth, you know, the large bandwidth and the low latency aspects. Um, so the key question, you know, still remains, you know, today that what are the applications? Like, what applications are going to be used that um, will leverage the APIs and will actually need the APIs? Uh, the onboarding application, especially the third-party applications, uh, is one of the, um, you know, challenge that, that the industry will have to solve. Right now at the edge, you know, we are pretty comfortable about deploying 5G, or we have a pretty good vision of you know, how to deploy 5G RAN and the core network components. But as it comes to some of the other you know, URLCC applications, we really don't know how to onboard them, how to connect together. Uh, some of the applications, like air applications, that requires much more um, battery power in the mobile, how do you offload them into the, into the edge? And how are those APIs would work together? Um, you know, some of the applications such as analytics, uh, you could do a lot of the local analytics at the edge without you know, sending the data to the core. Um, and, but how are those applications gonna get you know, connected, uh, have the internet services and, and so forth? How would they get connected to the operators, uh, other third parties, or even the over the top providers, right? So again, the context um, you know, Doug mentioned, but we really have not as an industry kind of figured out what are those contexts going to be. And of course, the exposure mechanism is, is what we're trying to figure out. That's, that's uh, what we need help from the industry kind of um, work together to, to work this out. All right, so um, there's a couple of key, at least in the 5G network with an ONAP orchestration layer, there's a couple of key uh, functions that uh, we think are critical to exposing this, the APIs that we've just been talking about. Um, we'll start with ONAP. ONAP is, is going to be a consolidation point for a lot of the, the, the information that is coming from the network functions that are, are mostly in blue here. So some of the network functions are in, in green and orange. But you see these, these, these yellow sort of uh, ovals with dotted lines. They're, they're sort of like we, where we know they need to be, um, they need to be given the inf giving the information to ONAP. We're not exactly sure what the, the interface will be yet. We're not sure of the standardization, but that has to happen in order to, to take advantage of the information that will be provided and generated by the network function in, in the 5G world. So ONAP's definitely going to be a key hub for the software, the network functions that are, are creating the service layer here. Um, on top of that, we are looking at a couple of different areas where how do you expose the a APIs? Where do you expose the APIs? Should the API exposure be centralized uh, or regional or highly distributed? So we have several examples of that. And in the, the bottom left, we have an, an NEF network exposure function, which is a, a 5G core uh, network function that its role, one of its roles is to, to provide an uh, interface from an external world uh, to request information of the, uh, that's within the 5G network. So this could be information like we talked about before, network conditions, uh, user identity, things of that nature. So um, that's one of the key functions that is provided by, by the 5G core. And we're showing two different distributions. Again, the highly distributed um, scenario where we have the network exposure function co-resident, physically co-resident with the UPF and a, a distributed ONAP instance as well. And you can see also there's a, there's a radio access network functions as well. Um, this high distribution um, is probably what most people are thinking about when they think about Edge. And I think some of the uh, dis, uh, other organizations like Etsy are, are thinking about when they're talking about um, Mac. Um, 
and this will likely be one of the scenarios here. Um, a more traditional scenario, uh, which may or may not be the first place we start with, so sort of look at how this topology will look over time, is have a more of a centralized or regional approach where the NEF, which is in the upper right-hand side here, is, is sort of sitting with the, uh, its, its uh, brothers and sisters in the 5G uh, core. Uh, this is a very much traditional uh, you know, TOCO model in many respects. Um, in this model, I, I, for the right now, I sort of prefer because if you're uh, an API-based uh, network, you, want, you don't want it, the applications that have a hard time to find the API that you want to use. So centralized or regionalized, it might provide a, an easier way of initial consumption. As we do optimizations, I think you'll start looking at uh, distri distribution over time. But th you know, the goal here is that there's not one deployment method. We'll probably see a, a several different types, and they're not all bad. They're just different choices and, and different timelines and, and for different use cases. Um, I think in many respects, if you have highly latency sensitive uh, API requests and response, and it has to, the information has to be derived from the network, you might have a distributed uh, solution. If you have less, uh, less sense, time sense of response, or your response requires a gathering of much more information before a response can be uh, sent back, then it might be a regional or centralized deployment model. It might be a better choice for you. So Doug, if you mention a little bit about the application oh, function, uh, my, I love that. I'm sorry, thank you, uh, Hasib. So, um, there's the application function, which is on the bottom right here, is, is an, another way of thinking about an API, API gateway. In this case, the uh, AF stands for application function, and it's, it's really, it could be several different uh, roles. It could have the ability to, to be the destination of some of the user's traffic, and then the user uh, device uh, or user themselves could, could re query or request uh, indirectly or directly information from the network. Um, it, it could be uh, something that is, is monitoring what's going on in the network and based on conditions uh, could send information to the uh, or request into the network exposure function or directly into the network functions to, to make a request or, or um, in some other manner provide feedback into the, uh, back to the user. Um, again, another dense slide here, uh, but just to kind of talk a little bit about this slide on the far left is really uh, a, a set of bullets that would equal a closed loop, um, which is basically, in the, uh, basically a combination of observation and then response. So you see sort of the green is sort of um, what you would need to gather information and, and, and the orange is sort of a re response based on what you've seen. Uh, and, and what I really want to focus on here is, is the gaps. So the gaps are, uh, this is not a comprehensive list of the gaps, and if you're, if you're security-minded, you'll probably immediately see that there's some security is not listed as one of the gaps, but it is clearly one of the gaps, both from subscriber policy as well as sort of network and traditional security. Um, but the other types of gaps that we have highlighted are that there's, uh, we need to make sure we have a way of, of controlling and configuring these highly distributed systems. Uh, I think you've heard, probably heard about these same scenarios or same um, gaps in other forums and other conversations. And so I think it's, it's pretty well understood that some of these gaps are, are, are uh, need to be covered. Uh, synchronizing the observations or observability and controllability. So in some cases, we have to figure out how to do short-term closed loop type of uh, controls so that we don't have out of sync conditions or we have two, two or more uh, types of actions trying to be applied to the same user, same network function. Uh, there's also, you know, vendor lock-in is a really a, a common problem that we want to avoid, and openness is generally a way to do that. And then, you know, some of the other things we want to look at are, are how do you get access to real-time data, how do you get access to real-time control, control links, and, you know, what's, what are the right strategies to, to incorporate ONAP. Um, also, sort of a, another note on the bottom right of the slide is, is that ORAN, Open RAN, is a, a relatively new initiative, and it's looking to cover some of these uh, gaps, and, but it can't cover it all by, by themselves. So we're going to be looking for a community to help solve the, these gaps that we mentioned, plus, plus others as, as we uh, dig deeper into this topic. 
Yeah, and also, I guess, a couple of other things that are not mentioned here, Doug, is that um, the regulatory aspect of it, right? The privacy aspect of it, and then context, you know, when you have the context, you need to kind of sanitize the context so that you don't give out the privacy information, just give out the data that are only necessary. And that's, as you know, that in the industry, it's being discussed a lot nowadays, so we suspect that there will be some, um, some boundary conditions on that as we... Yeah. as we deploy this, uh, this net in the, in the future. Yeah, very definitely. Yeah. Okay, so now we wanted to talk about the, uh, you know, the, the APIs, like what are the APIs and, and what do we think that um, would this model evolve towards? So we kind of went through and classified them in, in four distinct areas. Um, and then, of course, as you see that ONAP um, is going to play a big role, and the disaggregated RAN and the, and the core will, of course, have another um, you know, play to it because of the 5G um, influence and the architecture. So the first one is uh, you know, somewhat non-real-time uh, type of applications, which requires you know, information in the range of 100 milliseconds. And these are internal third-party applications. And the internal and external um, here is mentioned um, in the sense or the, in the meaning of that it's external to the operator's network and internal to the operator's network. And third-party is you know, mentioned as that anybody other than operators are basically uh, working on that. And the operators could also be now doing their own development as well. Um, and typically, in, in, the, in this case here, the third party also, is in some places, means that non-traditional telco vendors, um, like you know, non, not, none of your the incumbents, basically. So, in, in the first case, that you know, there would be a lot of applications that would be going inside the own app um, in the DMAP, so they will have access to the own app data. And they will basically provide different services, you know, micro microservices or otherwise, and they would most probably be in the proximity of the DCAE, which is their data collection and analytics engine, and also, you know, stay with the, the policy uh, framework to understand or get applied by the policy so that the APIs can, you know, can be executed properly. Um, and then a lot of the ANAI information, which is the network status information, would also most probably go into this, this type of applications. Uh, the second one is it's the near real time, and this would basically sit in the core, you know, in the edge, um, at the, at the top of the, the RAN function on the very connected to the CU CP, and these would be the the internal applications again. This will most probably be optimizing optimizing application. Uh, for example, to basically do uh, you know, programming of the RAN capacity management. It could be related to your RF distribution or uh, some sort of antenna kind of management as well. So, so it, it are, these are some of the things that could be very closely related to the RAN and the core network function. But they would be internal, but because of the disaggregation uh, of the RAN, now you have the ability to kind of have modular presence towards some of the high-level abstraction of the RAN functions that you can now connect uh, with those APIs. And these would be in the range of 10 to 100 uh, milliseconds. And then there are the third kind, which is the, the one that we currently see today in the 4G networks too. Uh, these are the APIs that uh, you know, a lot of the operators today have exposed to the developers. Uh, so this would most probably be going out of the external API framework of ONAP or, or some other gateway that um, the, the operators have today. Uh, so this actually started from the old wipe gateways type of uh, you know, deployment. So these are the same, um, you know, um, uh, I guess, the, the same type of functionality in a different incarnation in, in, this, in this context. And then the fourth kind is, again, the third-party external applications, but they will be sitting in the EUEs. So there are a lot of applications that are in the EUEs today, but not all of them are really connected to the network or do not get to have access to the rich functionality that that network could offer. 
So those are, I guess, some of the, the ways that we see the API to evolve. So um, then quickly wanted to go over the, the deployment. So the deployment, you know, as we know, I mean, in the OpenStack terminology, we have the control nodes and the compute and the storage. And then we are showing that it's basically be deployed um, from an upper layer with, with ONAP with multi-cloud services. So there will be different kind of Veeam. And then, uh, you know, there are some tools, uh, zero touch provisioning. I mean, you know, the uh, airship is one of the things that just came about, which could be relevant here. So, so there are many uh, open source activities that are actually going on towards this in terms of deploying, deploying the edge components. And we believe that the API would be one part of it. So OpenStack, um, you, you know, we all know about that. There is open edge computing, which is kind of OpenStack++ with some changes in the KMU. So, uh, and then you have the EdgeX Foundry, which are you know, exposing APIs to the, some sort of developer uh, base. Uh, ONAP, we already talked about it. Um, Airship is some of the tool set that has been uh, you know, recently introduced uh, to, to OpenStack that would be very useful for containerizing uh, of the control plane of the OpenStack components to reduce the footprint uh, and, and do some thin level of control. Then um, Starling X is also some of the things that Wind River has uh, you know, com uh, contributed to OpenStack uh, to do a lot of the control plane management and optimization around in, uh, in part of their Titanium cloud portfolio. And uh, we have been hearing a lot about it in the form of Acrino that would be you know, doing all of the, or using all of those components from different open source, and as well as it will basically develop some of their own um, you know, components and, uh, uh, you know, and, and think applications that are be needed to basically deploy edge stack um, in more efficient and automated way. So with that, Doug. Just a quick uh, view. This I think we stole this from Condon, but essentially, um, what I wanted to say here is that you know the APIs we're referring to are really at the the, the top uh, couple of rows, right? So you have the what I call services or the VNFs uh, and applications. You have the APIs, and I think, in, and in general, I want to really point out that the APIs, whether they be initially thought of an edge API or initially thought as a, as a um, centralized API, the, the reality is. I believe that we're gonna have a common set of APIs across the entire network. So at some point in the near future, Edge and not Edge, whatever the not Edge is, would be essentially using the same APIs and, and the same applications and that we would develop, or hopefully others will develop, we'll, we'll be able to leverage them. Okay, so the last slide. Uh, so we basically, in, a conclusion, in conclusion, we are using the, the 5G architecture framework and a lot of the common platforms, and we're hoping that Acreano will bring all of this together. We still believe that the context is the, the king. It has a lot of implications that could be realized and uh, potentially you know, provided as a service to the community. And the business cases are not clear, so that's uh, one of the things that we need to work on as a, as a community. So I think that's all we had, and we'd like to thank you, these folks uh, that are listed here for their contribution to this, uh, to this content. The questions, yeah. right? Hey, Doug, Jeff Hartley with Lumina. Um, Three-part question. Uh, have you gotten as far as defining like preferences or guidance for how you'd like transport protocol for the APIs to be handled, something like, I don't know, pub, sub, thin, lightweight, like MQTT, ZMQ, anything like that. Secondly, to address the encryption uh, with the advent of a couple of the the bodies that you've just talked about, um, and like with um, you know Danos and things like that, you have direct exposure to crypto offload and a lot of commodity network chipsets mm -hmm. and like Xeons even and things like that. So uh, could that be used to sort of superimpose like TLS offloading for the the security requirements of said transport, even if we're just payload? Uh, and third, with the not current, but next release and in about six months of ONAP, when you start to have containerization and decomposition of some of the things like SDNC and AppC, 
Have you thought about like a microservice approach kind of encompassing that, um, the API endpoint, handling the transport protocol as well as any translation and cap, decap, et cetera? I know it's a big question. Those are three questions. Okay, so let me get that. <clears throat> the first one is we've just started to look at the protocols. Mm -hmm. um, so we have not made a decision yet. So, I, you know, be great help if, you know, people in the room or the community would, because we want to find the right <clears throat> balance, right? I, you know, you mentioned everything from security and ease of use, things of that nature all have to be factored in to it. I don't really have any bias. I just want to make sure it's easy and consumable for all. And standard. And, st and open. And open. Yeah. open and open. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, the standard is good, but open is Better okay. is better, but um, required actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. um, and the last one, there's a lot of work going on with ONAP. I don't know what's going to come in their next release, but definitely ONAP's going to be critical to kind of make this. All, all the, it's the glue, is what I refer to it to make this all work together. So um, you know, this is a lot of this. These things are brand new and just discussion points. So uh, we'll have to definitely factor it into the the, ne the next several releases. It's probably going to come in pieces as well. Okay, we'll pitch in. Yeah, and we did not factor in the transport, but you know that's going to be there. I mean, that's one of the things that actually makes a lot of the things happen. So, cool. Yeah, we've been having a lot of luck with uh, MQTT and ZMQ. Is why I throw those couple yeah. out there. They're, yeah, they're right. light, and yeah. any little processor can do the in cap and decap on them. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So, thank you very much for mentioning that security was a gap. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've been well trained. Yeah. At least I think I am. Yeah. Um, probably by my office. Uh, Walt Barnes, Chief Security Office, AT&T. Uh -huh. um, have you thought about authentication and authorization? Because every point of disaggregation is a new API uh -huh. where there wasn't one before. So what are your thoughts on how you're going to do that? So the, the, there's, the, we didn't really talk about it, but there are, the NEF is going to be probably like a proxy or a gateway. Um, so what you see is in a topology that is there will be an external and internal interface points, and the external ones will have, you know, much more highly scrutinized access controls for both, you know, uh, for authentication, authorization, roles, things of that nature will all be part of that. It's, we're going to have to grow our way into it because a lot of these things don't exist yet, so we'll probably have to start with very strict rules and loosen them up over time. Um, internally, we're, you know, I think we need to kind of talk through it's the same API, same structure, you know, how much security do we need sort of within the network querying um, other network functions or are getting, you know, information. Um, we will, it's work in progress. It's only broadly covered in some of the standardizations, mostly left to implementation, um, which is usually the case with security. Um, but, but we'll get there. We can't deploy, we won't deploy without all the security for operator and sort of authentication of the, of the requester, but also um, making sure, as, as uh, Asim mentioned, privacy is also going to be as, as big or bigger part of it. We have to make the data secure and private, and whatever that means for every use case might be a little different, but that's definitely what we need to factor in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have time for one more? I don't yeah, know. two more minutes. Okay. All right, Paul Andre, you said you didn't have an easy question for Asib. <laughs> 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 So you talk about all those APIs, and, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that they need to work across vendors, one set of APIs across the network, uh, that they would be open. And uh, are, are we are we Dreaming. heading towards a very rich set of APIs that have a lot of capabilities, or, or, or a simple set? And one of the challenges that, that uh, I have is that there are people developing software for uh, developing those applications, and, and they don't know very much about yeah. uh, the wireless network, its architecture, the different vendors, their, their different characteristics, but yet there are the people who would write the applications that we would need those APIs. Let me start, and um, see if we can jump in. So um, you said rich, and how, where are we headed? I think those are sort of the paraphrase. So I think we're going to start with a relatively small list, uh, and then we'll... Um, but we need to get with the right list. So what we don't, what, most of the API definitions and discussions have been mostly focused on the standards organizations or organizations that are very narrowly focused on, on um, network uh, type information. And what we don't have right now is a community of application developers and what they would want and what they would need. We did cover a little bit in the slides, but not, I didn't cover it in detail. And, the, the two are, are very critical. What do you need to make your application work? And what do you want if you had 
you know, a, a clean sheet or we were able to provide it to you. The two may, always, may not always align. You may have, you'll definitely have more of what you want than what you need, but you need to figure out how to, um, to get at the minimum of what you want and extend to what you need. So I think we're going to start small. I think we're going to grow into what, what makes sense. And what I think, we talked about wireless, but I, I think the APIs need to be wireline, wireless, access agnostic. We should be thinking about it, whether it be United States Comcast or, or AT&T or Verizon or CenturyLink. It shouldn't matter from an edge application perspective. How we implement the, the underlying capabilities of the, of the network will be different, so how we implement may be different, but the API calls and, and exposure information should be the same. Yeah, and just I'll end, end with the, the, the challenge still is to get the web developers, the web scalers into the loop, into the community. Yeah. And that's, we, we are working towards that, but that is a challenge. I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.